Hey again everybody, in this video we are going to define compact sets and we're going to do it in a way which is very specific to this class uh, but then I'll tell you if you were say working in a topology class how you would define it in that situation. So, uh, so we're going to start here with uh, a definition of compact which is actually quite easy because we're working in the real numbers. So definition, um, and this is really, I'm, I'm going to make this very clear, this is for the real numbers, or if we were working in Rn, it would work uh, just as well, but we're just going to work over the real numbers here. Uh, a subset of the real numbers is compact simply if it is closed and bounded. And that's it. That's all we need. There's your compactness. Uh, it's usually pretty easy for us to check if something is bounded and closed. Well, we're, we're getting pretty good at, at checking closure, so that, that's all you have to do. Uh, we're going to give in this video a couple of alternative characterizations of compactness uh, that are better when you're trying to generalize into more exotic situations. But for the real numbers, due to something called the hein borel theorem, uh, this is actually all we need. So let's write down a few examples. So for example, if I take any closed interval, well, this is closed. It's a closed interval. And it's bounded. So this is compact. Um, if I take any finite union, ah, well, what do we know about finite unions? Well, if we have closed sets, we proved that any finite union of closed sets is closed. Well, what about bounded sets? Well, if you have a finite union of bounded sets, then they are still bounded because you can take a bound for each one of them and then take the max of all those bounds. And because this is a finite list, that max exists. And so the finite union of bounded sets is still bounded. And so any finite union of compact sets, so for example, intervals, closed intervals, is compact. Uh, how about another example? How about the empty set? Right? Well, we saw that the empty set was closed. And it is bounded, right? It's, in fact, it's bounded uh, by any uh, any positive number, that's fine. So this is compact. Okay, how about some non-examples? Right? What are the things that are not compact? Uh, well, how about the real numbers? We do know that the real numbers are closed. Right? We proved that. In fact, they're both open and closed. Right? It's a clopen set. Uh, but it is not bounded. Right? So this is not bounded. And so that implies that the real numbers, uh, the set of real numbers is not compact. Okay. Uh, another non-example. Let's say I take the union of all sets of the form n comma n plus a half. So we're looking at one comma three halves, union two comma five halves, uh, union uh, three comma seven halves, etc. Okay, well this is also not bounded and hence it is not compact. Oops, not bounded. Hence it is not compact. So very easy to check compactness for the real numbers, at least in these kind of situations. Okay, one last example, which is open intervals. So let's take an open interval like one comma three. Well, this one is definitely bounded, but is not closed. Okay, again, easy to check, which implies that the open interval one three is not compact. All right, uh, so, uh, essentially, compactness is in some ways 
kind of the next best generalization of finiteness. So there's a lot of areas in mathematics where you know something is true about finite sets and you would like to generalize that somehow to infinite sets. And it doesn't work for just any infinite set. But if you're looking at a compact set, then you actually may have some, some hope. Uh, so it's a nice generalization. In fact, um, you get here, you even see like this whole finite union of intervals. And we're going to show another characterization that has something to do with finiteness, finiteness in a little bit. Uh, so it, it's it's kind of a nice uh, next step up from from finite. Oh wait, um, we're going to do a different characterization here. So this is going to be what we're going to call limit compactness. So limit compactness is going to be testing compactness by looking at the limits of sequences. So if we have some subset of the real numbers, then S is compact if and only if. Okay, so that's why it's going to be a different characterization. Every S sequence. So remember, this means I'm looking at sequences whose uh, out, or like whose terms are in the set S. Okay, we know the domain of a sequence is in the positive integers, but the codomain is usually you know, undecided. Here we're only looking at sequences whose terms lie in this set S. Okay, and we want to know that every S sequence has a subsequence that converges. Okay, now let's pause here. It converges. If we have a compact set, we know that it's closed and bounded. But let's just forget about the closed for a moment and talk about bounded. We know that bounded sets by the bolzano weierstrass theorem have a subsequence that converges. Hey, that's what we're saying here. But why do we need compactness for that, right? Bounded already told us that. What does the closed part give us? And the answer is that we also know not just that the subsequence converges, but it converges to an element of S. Okay, and this comes back to our lectures on, on closed sets, where we know that when you had closed uh, sets, they had to contain their limit points. Okay, so this subsequence, or has a subsequence that converges, that's coming from the bounded part. And to an element of S, that's coming from the closed part of compactness. All right, now we're going to be proving that in the second half of the course, so we get to move on here to our other characterization of compactness, which is going to be actually probably the, the most common initial definition for compactness that you would see in like a topology course. And the reason why this definition is going to be quite good is because it doesn't have anything to do with having to look at the measure uh, the distance measure on the real number. So for example, when we talked about bounded, then we need to know, right, like, okay, we're a certain distance away from the origin, right? Um, and and yes, we can do that in some sense in a general topological space, but it, it somehow feels a little bit better when you see the, the definition we actually give. So to give this different characterization, we first need a definition. Um, so We'll let S be some subset of the real numbers. And let I be an indexing set. Ooh. Now remember, when I use that phrase, let I be an indexing set, that means I'm going to be talking about an arbitrary collection. It could be finite. It could be infinite. It could be uncountably infinite. Any collection, right? And I is just our way of indexing that set so we can keep track of things. So a collection of open sets, let's call it O, which consists of sets of the form uh, S alpha, where alpha runs through I. Okay, so there's our indexing set. So we have this big collection is called an open cover of this set S, right? That was the initial set we gave if S is contained in the union of all the S alphas. 
Okay, so it's sort of in 2D world, right? Maybe I have this set S here, and all of a sudden I'm going to write down a bunch of S alphas. Okay, and the point is, is that these S alphas that I write down, when I put them all together, they should cover up this set S, right? Which they appear to do here. Okay, and it may be an infinite number of them, that's fine. However, if I can find say n of them in this set O, such that S is contained now in this finite union. Then we call that subcollection, so this is S1 now through Sn, a finite, oops, we'll make this capitalized, a finite subcover. Okay, so maybe when I originally tried to cover up S, I used an infinite number of these, these open sets, but then somebody else comes around and says, look, you only need 17 of them. Now you found a finite subcover. Okay. Um, so let's do a quick example of that. Uh, so here we go, example. Uh, so let's say I take the set, uh, and let's call it O again. And it's going to look at all intervals of the form. Well, I take some real number and I subtract one tenth. And then I take that same real number and I add one tenth. Okay, and I do this for all real numbers. Okay, so this is an open cover of, say, the real numbers. All right, it's an open cover because every real number lies in one of these O's, or, or the, the, these intervals within O, I should say, right? In fact, A is, of course, an element of the interval, right? This is just an A coin of radius one-tenth. Okay, so that's an open cover. However, if I use this open cover, there is no finite subcover, right? If I chose just a finite number of these, I am going to certainly be bounded. Okay, and so I can't get all the real numbers. So this has, uh, O has no finite subcover. Okay, however, if I think of O as an open cover not of R, so if O is treated, let's say is treated, as an open cover, not of R, but of, let's say, the uh, closed interval 0 to 1. Then it has a finite subcover. OK, in fact, what I can do, what is the finite subcover? I'm going to look at the following. I'm going to take 0 plus a tenth and 0 minus a tenth. So that gives me everything. Well, it actually gives me some stuff outside of the interval, and that's okay, right? To be an open cover doesn't mean you're doing it in the most efficient way possible, right? We just need to cover everything in this closed interval 0 to 1, and that certainly hits everything right here between 0 and 1 tenth. Okay? Then I'll move over, and let's say I go between, uh, how about uh, 1 tenth plus 1 tenth, uh, minus 1 tenth and one-tenth plus one-tenth. All right, so this is uh, here that we are going between, oh, I have these in the opposite order, my apologies. Here we had minus one-tenth to positive one-tenth. So here we have zero to two-tenths. Okay, so we're getting now all the stuff between one-tenth and two-tenths that we didn't have already. And we keep going here. Now we'll go uh, two-tenths minus one-tenth and two-tenths plus one-tenth. Okay, and so that would give me one-tenth to three-tenths. And I keep going, right? I keep going, and then at some point, I'm going to get uh, nine-tenths plus one-tenth, or minus one-tenth, and nine-tenths plus one-tenth. So this is giving me eight-tenths to one. Now, it doesn't give me the entire interval because I'm missing one itself. So I have to do one more. 
and I'll do one minus a tenth, one plus a tenth, and that will give me everything between nine tenths and eleven tenths. But that takes me even more than I need. Okay, so I found I have an open cover which is all of these things for zero one, but I didn't need all of them. In fact, I am only going to need some some finite subset of them, right? And so this is a, a finite sub cover. Okay. okay, so now what is the theorem? This new characterization of compactness. Okay, so this is going to be compactness and open covers. Okay, and the statement is that a set is compact. Okay, and this is a, where I really should say, right, a subset of R, a subset of the real numbers, is compact if and only if. Okay, now here, this is very strange. Every open cover of the set has a finite subcover. Okay, so we just showed that for a particular open cover of the closed interval 0, 1, that there was a finite subcover, right? We did it for one open cover. In order to use this characterization, we would have to show that every single open cover that anybody could put down, right, any time, has a finite subcover. And that sounds like a lot of work to do, all right? You go back to our definition of compactness for at least the real numbers, and you say, oh, closed and bounded. That was really easy to check, all right? It's totally not obvious how we're going to check, for example, the open interval one to three, which we said, oh, well, it's, it's not closed, therefore it's not compact, done. How do I show that there is some open cover of the interval one to three that does not have a finite subcover? Okay. Well, of course one can do it, all right? But it, it's definitely not obvious how one is going to do it. So what's the value of this? Well, one, when you go into general topological spaces, the primary object that you get as soon as you say I have a topology is open sets. So having a definition in terms of open sets is quite nice, right? You don't need any extra structure. Second, let's say you happen to know that something is compact independently, somehow you know it, and now instead of having to show, right, that every open cover has a finite subcover, you get to use the fact that every open cover has a finite subcover. And that's telling you a lot of information. Okay? All right, so that's all we're going to do for now. Uh, in the second half of the class, we are going to go back and prove these uh, characterizations are equivalent, at least in the real numbers, to being closed and bounded. Uh, but for now, uh, that's going to be enough. Uh, next time, we're going to start up a new section of the course where we're going to try to extend the work that we've done in terms of uh, limits of sequences to more general, a more general situation, that, which is functions whose domain doesn't have to be uh, the positive integers. Function, the domain could be anything we like. Okay, so we'll talk about functions and we'll move into to continuity and some of the uh, consequences of that. All right, we will see you next time.